Well, welcome to this tour of the Kikubri Kirkyard. Uh, I'm Mike Dukert. I'm the chairman of the Kikubri History Society. And these are my fellow volunteers, uh, Chris Ingram, uh, David Devereaux, and Don Cowell, who will also be your guides uh, later on in the tour. But we'll start by going up the hill to the top there, where you get a fine view of the site, where David will tell us more about the history of it. Well, it was actually in uh, 2013 that the History Society started organising these weekly guided walks in the Kirkyard. To, to find the inspiration behind these walks, we need to go back to June 2010, when 47 of the headstones were vandalised. Many of them were pushed over and uh, others severely damaged. Well, as you can imagine, the people of the town were outraged and the community council started a fundraising campaign which was immediately supported and uh, many individuals and groups helped to raise funds. However, there still wasn't enough money in the kitty to carry out this expensive work. But fortunately, we had a grant of £33,000 from the Heritage Lottery Fund. But one of the stipulations on that grant was that we do more to generate interest in the site. Um, <coughs> so the first was the installation of these interpretation panels explaining a bit more about the Kirkyard. And the second was the History Society taking on the job of organising these guided walks, which have become very popular with both visitors and local residents alike. The tour examines a lot of the architectural styles of the gravestones themselves and the materials used and points out um, some of the interesting individuals who are commemorated, commemorated on them. Uh, but as well as that it talks about the, the history of the site itself. So I'll hand over to my colleague David to talk about that. The, the history of this fascinating site begins way back in the 8th century <clears throat> when we know that the uh, Northumbrian churchmen established a church in the old part of the cemetery below me here, you have to remember that this part of Scotland in the 8th century was part of the Kingdom of Northumbria. And the churchmen were keen on establishing a what they call a minster church, or like a mission church, uh, a base for clerics to spread the gospel in the area and of course they dedica dedicated their church to the patron saint of, North of Northumbria, St Cuthbert. The first reference to this church is in 1162 when Elred of Rivo, who was the uh, abbot of Rivo, on, a, on an inspection visit to the then relatively new abbey of Dundrennan, also a Cistercian abbey, uh, paid a visit here on the feast day of St Cuthbert on March the 20th and even then he could write of seeing a, uh, an ancient stone church uh, on this site. So 300 years on from the foundation or so of the, of the church it was recognised as an ancient establishment by, by Elred. So this was the church dedicated to St Cuthbert, the Kirk of St Cuthbert, Kirkubri, and such must have been its fame and reputation that when the later town and port developed on the River Dee, just beyond us here, it took the name of this well-known site, Kirkubri. So the name has moved, if you like, from here down to the river, and this is the place that gave the town its name. Now we know roughly where the site of this church was. It was recognisable up until the mid-19th century but over the years there have been a number of important archaeological finds um, including particularly uh, the most southerly find of a pagan Viking grave probably dating to the 10th century so roughly about the period of the now famous Galloway Horde find, uh, made further up the, the valley here in, uh, near Balmagee. And uh, this find here comprised of a number of grave goods. There was no skeleton, no, no, no body, but 
there was a Viking sword, a, uh, a ring pin for holding the, uh, uh, the, the deceased clothes, and a bead. And these are typical grave goods of a Viking or a Hiber Hiberno-Norse individual, and uh, one of a number who was settling in this area um, from the late 9th century onwards. And these finds can be seen in the Stuartry Museum. There have been other early finds as well, for example a papal bulla, which is the, the lead seal attached to a papal document dating to the 11th century. No doubt that was in the archives of the church here at one time. And earlier still, fragments of what seems to be a field cross or an, an open air cross, which might have been the precursor to the church and may date, in fact, to the late 8th century here. And again, you can see that in the Stuartry Museum. Well, we've, we're standing outside the main gate of the kirkyard now, but this wasn't always the main gate. The earlier maps suggest that the, the access to the churchyard was actually from a road which ran through the later part of the cemetery, and it came in a little bit to the left of where I'm standing now. But in fact, this is a rebuilt gate. This parts of this kirkyard gate were in fact from the old town's Mikkeljet, or the great gate, or the main gate of the town, which stood at the um, east end of the high street, not far from the present Selkirk Arms Hotel. But in the late 18th century, when the town was, the town's population was uh, expanding and the area available for housing was simply in inadequate, the town council had plans for expanding the town and uh, they wanted to extend the high street and, and really the, the gate was something of an obstacle to that. So the decision was taken in 1771 to demolish the gate, um, but being, um, being very, very conscious of not wasting materials, sometime after that date, probably the later 1770s, 1780s, the materials were used to not only build this gate, but in fact build the, we're actually standing on a bridge here over the, the Millburn, which is to my right here and uh, the materials are used for both for the gate and for the bridge. So some of these uh, globes on top of the um, gate seem to have been reused from that time. And if we look through the gate, I talked about the early church of St Cuthbert. When we look through the gate we can see that the path rises up a little bit and then dips down again and we think that the path is actually rising up over the foundations and what's left of the site of that early uh, 8th century church um, dedicated to St Cuthbert, the original Kirk of St Cuthbert, the original Kukubri. We'll go through the gate now and we'll look at this substantial monument which you can see on my right now. This is the Ewart monument which I'll tell you more about when we go through into the kirkyard. We're looking at um, what's the largest uh, monument in the kirkyard and uh, I'm sure the most costly to, to make. It dates to 1644 and was erected by John Ewart, who was a landowner and merchant in the Kukubri area, to commemorate his son Andrew, who died in 1642. It's made of uh, Netherlaw sandstone, this rather lovely grey mauve coloured sandstone, which is found near Dundrennan. In fact, most of Dundrennan Abbey is built from this fine grained sandstone, which is actually can be sculpted, it takes carving very well. And if we look at the um, style of the overall stone, it's a mix of Gothic and classical, what you might call Scottish Renaissance. You've got the pointed arch, gothic arch, but you've also got the, um, the twin pillars on either side with floral capitals at the top. Lots of interesting lettering, some fine examples of the lettering at that time, and various mortality symbols as well. For example, obviously the, the skull and the crossbones. And we've also got 
what appear to be crossed shovels or spades, which are indicative of the grave diggers or the sexton's uh, tools, and another mortality symbol. But why such a big monument? We know that the, the Ewarts were one of the most important families in Kakubri in the late 1640s, 1650s, into the 1660s. Almost every other year they held the post of provost or chairman of the, or head of Kakubri Town Council, the Borough Council. So they were a very prominent family. They were succeeding at this time in the McClellan family who had dominated the town's affairs before then. And if you look in Greyfriars Church, you'll see a monument to Sir Thomas Maxwell, uh, to some, Sir Thomas McClellan and his wife Grizzle, which again is a large monument like this. And I just wonder if this monument is making a bit of a statement, almost like a political statement for the family, to the Ewart family. It's saying, you know, we're here now, we're putting, this, this, is a, this, this reflects our status within the community to erect such a large monument as this. The Ewarts are an interesting family. They found their way eventually to Liverpool and they were successful merchants in Liverpool. And William Ewart, or A. William Ewart, was MP for what's called the Dumfries Boroughs in the 19th century. And the Dumfries Boroughs, in fact, included Kakubri. So he was well aware of his um, Kakubri origins and he was actually invited to be MP um, because of that. Previously, he'd been MP for Liverpool and Wigan. If you go to Dumfries, you'll find that the main library is the Ewart Library. And that's named after this William who was MP for so many years in the 19th century. In fact, he was, that library was uh, funded by, the, by Andrew Carnegie, like many in Scotland. And it was actually Andrew, Marchini, uh, Andrew Carnegie who suggested that the library be named the Ewart Library because one of, the, one of William's achievements as an MP was to carry through the public, the Free Libraries Act whereby libraries could be established in towns and communities funded from the local taxation, local rates. And that was really the origin of the public libraries we have today. Uh, local councils would take that, take advantage of that legislation and set up libraries. So we have a lot to thank a descendant, a direct descendant, William Ewart, of the man who erected this monument here in Kukubri. Now we're going to move across to look at another headstone like this one, it's got some very interesting mortality symbolism and other symbols which I'd like to show you. This is uh, an 18th century headstone which is of interest uh, not so much for the person that was buried here as the symbolism. Uh, we have the normal memories of death, we have the skull and the crossbones and we have a winged hourglass all reminding us of mortality. But here in the centre, there is a hand clutching a hammer with a crown over it. This is a trade symbol, and it tells us whoever was buried here was a craftsman, a member of a guild. In this case, it would be the, the hammer men. Right? Um, trade symbols were quite common on 18th century uh, gravestones. Um, but as a hammer man, he was a member of the uh, local, one of the incorporated trades of Kukubri, which there are six, they're known as the Hale Six. These include the, the hammer men and glovers, the shoemakers, the square men, who were the masons, um, the clothiers, the tailors, and the weavers. Right? And he clearly was a hammer man, hence the symbol here, which means probably a metal worker. Um, the Hail Six of Kukubri still exist, although largely a ceremonial function now. Uh, but in 1587, the Hail Six were presented with a small replica cannon made in silver, known as the Sulligan, by James VI of Scotland. And it was a prize that was to be awarded annually for a shooting con contest, in the hope that uh, it would improve 
the uh, residents' uh, familiarity with firearms, which were replacing bows and arrows at that time. Okay. Uh, the silicon is in the Stewartry Museum, and the Hale Six do organise shooting contests still uh, on special occasions. And we think it is probably the uh, oldest sporting trophy in the country that is still actually in use. It could possibly be the, uh, the oldest one in the world that's still in use. Do not know on that. Uh, we do have another trade symbol further over uh, from a cord wainer, which was a hand clutching a knife, a cord wainer or, sh or shoemaker. We're now going to go and look at a, a much more ornate grave, table grave, over here. Well, we've come to the Tablestone Memorial to uh, Samuel Herries, who died in 1793 and was a merchant in Kukubri. He lived in the high street in a house near the toll booth. <clears throat> it's a large monument, as you can see, but if we look at the, the face of the slab here on the top, there's very little information about the man simply his name, his occupation and his death. There's a little bit of ornamentation on the slab with this sort of pie crust border and in every corner we have a little figure looks like a cherub something like that. These cherub symbols often with wings are actually representations of the soul rising to heaven after death so they you often find them alongside the mortality symbols that we've seen but this is the, if you like, the optimistic side of things, that there is death, but there is life after death, represented by these cherub-like figures. But what I want to show you, it's not so much the top here, but the six pedestals which support the slab, um, because these are some of the best rustic carving from this period, late 18th century, found in Scotland. And if you look at, if you pick up several books I could mention dealing with the subject of Scottish memorials, Scottish graveyards, you'll find illustrations very often of this particular monument. So if we look at it we can see familiar mortality symbols. Here's a full skeleton for example and here is a skull, the crossbones, this is perhaps one of our little cherubs at the bottom here. The pedestals, pedestals are not just carved on the outer face. You can also see the inner faces, which have got some very nice floral carving. And the inner faces in particular have, are well preserved because they've been protected from the weather by and large. So we've got those symbols there. And if we come round to this side, if you like the front of the monument, two intriguing figures. On the left hand side we have a figure with a hat, possibly a wig appearing underneath the hat, and he appears to be wearing a, a full frock coat with cuffs. Could well be the representation of a seaman, sea captain, or a merchant. Could this fact in fact be Samuel Herries himself? But on the other side, we appear to have a figure, a naked figure, with a lovely hairdo but no hat. And uh, could he be a Native American Indian? People that Harris might have traded with in the state, in what became the United States in America? Or have we got a connection with the slave trade here? Is this a slave? We just don't know. It either could be possible. If you look at the coat of arms, of, for example, of Sir William Douglas, who founded Castle Douglas and again was a, was a Galloway merchant, made a fortune in America, the two bearers on his coat of arms is a sea captain representing trade or perhaps himself and a Native American representing the people he was trading with in America, the source of his fortune, if you like, uh, his prosperity, and that's reflected on his Sir William's coat of arms. I'm moving around the, the back here. Um, we also see further symbols of, of death. There's a, the Grim Reaper, in fact, in the back here. 
And there's also some, some symbols which, uh, of, a, of a square, like a joiner's or a carpenter's square, and a pair of dividers, which may be symbols of uh, Freemasonry. Because in Kukubri, uh, the Freemasons' lodges were important in the past. They were important as the trades organisation, the six trades, the hail, hail trades were important, as was the town council. But in fact, you often find that the memberships of these three important groups, and I'm, I should probably add the Kirk Session as well, these four groups, uh, was, was, was common. There's a lot of duplication of names. These were just the, the, the four pillars of the Kakuba community in the 18th and early 19th century. So this is, a, this is a stone like so many others in the churchyard which reflects the distant trading connections uh, that Kakubri had in the past, particularly with the America and the West Indies. We're now going to look at another stone which reflects more than 19th century global connections of Kakubri, which was more with Australia and New Zealand. We're looking at the private plot of the Gordon family, Gordons from Campbelltown. Um, they lived locally in a place about four miles from Kukubri. And in particular, we're looking at the cross with the, with the, uh, with the anchor on it here, which has the most unusual inscription, which is um, in loving memory of Gordon and Louisa, a wedding gift from a mother and sisters. Now, William was a, a mariner and he was on the clipper ship Glenmark, which was trading in the Australia-New Zealand area. And in January 1872, in New Zealand, he married Marion Louisa Jones, the daughter of a Welsh immigrant. And in February of that year, 1872, the ship set sail laden with cargo and about 50 passengers, coming back to United Kingdom, where uh, William was anxious to bring his new bride back to meet his family. Unfortunately, the ship was struck by a hurricane and all were lost. There were no survivors whatsoever. Hence the very, very strange inscription on the cross. Okay. We're now going to move on and look at another rather sad story. Right. We're now looking at um, a Covenanter's Memorial Stone. Uh, these are common in most kirkyards in Scotland where they commemorate the Covenanters, the people who uh, refused to acknowledge James II as being the uh, spiritual head, and uh, were considered traitors as this reason, and they were hunted down. The stone uh, is carved across, it's, it's actually a poem, um, uh, once you read it, but basically it tells the story that um, two local residents here, uh, William Hunter and Robert Smith, were captured by um, Captain George Graham, that's uh, Graham of Claverhouse or Bloody Clavers, as he, as he was known. They were brought to Kukubri uh, because they'd been out at a Covenanters meeting, which was illegal. Uh, they were held in the toll booth until their trial, uh, where they were tried by Captains uh, Graham, Douglas and Bruce, uh, duly found guilty and were sentenced to death. Uh, they were taken out to the gibbet. They had been denied access. Nobody was allowed to visit them. They weren't allowed to write letters to friends or anything like this. And then when they came to the gibbet, when they tried to speak to the crowd, because public exec executions were public in those days, um, the soldiers beat the drums so that they could not be heard. They were then hung and decapitated. Their heads placed on pikes and their bodies are buried here. Uh, a very sad reminder of these killing times of the 1680s, that one there. The um, calligraphy itself is, is worth looking at, it's actually uh, very, 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 very good on this one. But this, this monument is also very unusual, we've got another inscription round the end, round the edge of the stone, uh, to Agnes Kirk, the daughter of a merchant um, who is uh, of, of, um, in Kukubri. And we don't know what the connection is. There's been a suggestion that this was a, an, a stone that had been reused. Um, alternatively, it could be that Agnes Kirk had some connection with, um, with, the, with the two martyrs here, um, possibly by marriage or intended marriage. 
We don't know. We haven't actually found that information yet. There's another martyr stone further over to uh, John Hallam, who was also um, captured by uh, Captain Graham and uh, duly hanged. And as I say, you find most of these stones in most of the Scottish kirkyards. Uh, we're now going to move on and look at another stone which is a little bit happier about a minister who used to be in this town. Uh, the Reverend Robert Muser was uh, the minister who wrote the first statistical account for Kukubri, uh published in the 1790s. He went on to marry Agnes Freeland, daughter of John Freeland, a merchant in Kukubri, and they had 13 children, seven boys and six daughters. Some of the boys became involved in the sugar trade in St. Lucia in the West Indies and the Centre for the Study of the Legacies of British Slavery indicates that they were slave owners until the abolition of slavery on St. Lucia in 1836. This is an unusual headstone um, erected by the Earl of Selkirk uh, in memory of Rosanna Coulthard, um, who was a the housekeeper on the Earl of Selkirk's estate in Kukubri. And it recognises her service of 64 years, initially as a, as a, a servant, but ultimately as housekeeper on the Earl of Selkirk's estate. Uh, she was born in July 1791 and she died in 1880. And she was part of the large Selkirk family estate uh, in Kukubri and she would have been an important official in that house because she ultimately rose to become housekeeper and study of census details of the early of Selkirk's estate indicates there were all sorts of other people involved in the estate, uh, maids, dairymen, gamekeepers, uh, agricultural labourers. It was a very large estate based on St Mary's Isle and she would have been an important member of that household. This was erected unusually by the Earl of Selkirk in view because of her service and an interesting feature on it is that it says uh, they recognize her service both at home and abroad so she must have traveled with the family at some stage during the time she was in service. Next door to it interestingly is the headstone of her family, the Coltart family, erected by John Coltart, who features in the Galavidian Encyclopedia written by MacTaggart, where he is referred to as the Laird Coltart. We're now off to see another headstone to Robert Beatty, who was a governor of the poorhouse. Uh, this is an interesting headstone for two reasons. First of all, it refers to Robert Beatty, Governor of the Union Poorhouse. Kakubri had a poorhouse built in 1851 and closed in 1953. Poorhouses were introduced in Scotland after 1845 when Scottish poor law was reformed and parishes were able to combine with other parishes to build institutions where poor people could be accommodated and looked after. Kakubri was one of the first parishes to build a poor house and it used to be uh, on the outskirts of the town along the Tonglen Road 
Opened in 1851, it lasted for over a hundred years and was finally closed in 1953 after the introduction of the National Health Service because by that time it had become a sort of hospital, a caring centre. Robert Beatty was the governor of the poorhouse from 1856 to 1869. He was the third governor of the poorhouse and came to Kukubri from Haddington Prison in 1856. So that's part of the interest of this stone. It refers to a poorhouse and an institution now no longer existing in Kukubri. What is also of interest, however, is that while the stone refers to Robert Beatty being the governor of the poorhouse, and some of his children and his wife are shown on the headstone, he is not shown here. And the reason for that is that in 1869, uh, he'd already been in post for 13 years in the poorhouse, he was involved in a sexual scandal which involved one of the inmates of the poorhouse. As a result of his involvement, he was required to resign and was replaced by a local merchant, uh, David Clark, whose headstone is also in the kirkyard. We don't know what happened to Mr. Beatty because this headstone shows the names of some of his children who died here and also at the bottom shows the name of his wife and she is shown to have died in Iowa in the United States. So whether they actually left the country and went to America to find a new life or not is a question that remains as we look at this headstone. We're now moving down the kirkyard to look at the gravestone of Billy Marshall and his amazing story. Uh, this is the grave of probably Billy Marshall, King of Gypsies, uh, probably our oldest resident and possibly our most famous. Um, Billy uh, died in 1792 at the reputed age of 120. Uh, we can't actually verify his age, but sources indicate that in fact he was well over 100, certainly, when he died. Um, he was an interesting character who led uh, what you can certainly describe as a colourful life. He was married 17 times, fathered many illegitimate children, including four when he was past 100, and needs to say he has many descendants. In fact, I think it's the commonest inquiry at the Stewartry Museum is where can we find Billy Marshall's grave. In his life, he joined the army and deserted seven times. He joined the navy and deserted three times. Uh, he led, reputedly led uh, a gang of villains in the area who were responsible for organised pickpocketing, for theft, for smuggling and indeed murder. Um, that said, he was always on very, very good terms with the local gentry. He was a very personable character and he had the respect and admiration of the local gentry and he was very, very careful, I think, not to offend them. And uh, this could explain why, for all his alleged criminal activity, he was never, ever prosecuted. He was, by trade, um, a, a horn carver. And indeed, the back of his stone has ram's horns and crossed spoons. And there are some examples of his work in the Stewartry Museum. He was also a captain of the Levellers, the rebels who um, went and pulled down all the dry stone dikes that were being erected by the landowners to the, uh, to the loss of the peasantry of the area. Yes, he was either a hero or a villain or a lovable rogue, depending entirely on your viewpoint. Uh, the top of Billy's stone is nearly always covered in coins, and we understand this is a gypsy custom. That whenever a gypsy visits the grave of another gypsy, they leave a coin, and the idea that money is there should another gypsy come along who is in need, who's short of a, a grub steak for a meal, and it was there. 
Um, I believe these coins are actually collected weekly and they go into one of the local charity boxes. The headstone is actually the original headstone, but a few years ago it was renovated by the, um, the Hale Six, the trade organisation in Kukubri. Billy had been a member of the Hale Six, um, probably as one of the Hammermen. We'll now move on and have a look at uh, the grave of uh, one of our local artists, Mr Hornhill. Well, these stones really tell the life history of one of Kukubri's most famous sons, the artist Edward Atkinson Hornell who went on to become a prominent member of the group of artists known as the Glasgow Boys. <coughs> and you'll note that his predecessors, right back to, what, 1782, we can see our shoemakers. <coughs> and William Hornell, we can see this story of, this is Hornell, the artist's father, William Hornell, and his mother, Anne Habishaw, who came from Bingley in Yorkshire. And he was also a shoemaker, and he and Anne went out to Australia in 1857 during the gold rush uh, to make boots and shoes for the miners. They already had a daughter, Margaret, who was born in, in Kakubri before they went, but also <coughs> Ellen was actually born on the boat en route to Australia. But sadly, she died at the age of seven um, <coughs> in 1864 which is actually the same year that Hornell was born, our artist was born. Um, and uh, with his twin brother, William. So Edward and William are twins. Um, now, Edward's other siblings, three other siblings also died quite young, Sarah at six weeks, and twins Charles and John died at a year. So a very sad start to uh, the family life. So the stone also records the death of Edward Atkinson Hornell himself uh, in, 18, in uh, 1933. And also another sister, Elizabeth, known as Tizzy, who lived in Broughton House with him all the time that he lived there from 1901. And his other sisters, Janet, Grace and uh, Annie, uh, all lived in number 18 High Street um, before, before they died. So, so importantly for us, Hornell left his home, Broughton House, uh, to the, in a very clear deed, saying that he wanted to leave it for the people of the Stewartry, this area, and visitors there too. And so now today we can go and see this, this magnificent house uh, and all its collection and valuable uh, and extensive collection that he's built up over his whole life. Uh, it is now run by the National Trust for Scotland, but it's certainly well worth a visit. But this stone, these stones, I think, are a great example of how they tell a life story of a family and, and can be very useful for family research. Uh, and all, out of interest, all the stones are recorded uh, in the Stuartry Museum uh, and also uh, main libraries locally. So if you're doing family research, certainly that's a very good place to start. Now, in 1866, I, two years after uh, she died, the whole family came back to Kikubri and lived in number 18 uh, High Street. Uh, but 12 years later, William Hornell, the father, went back out to Australia uh, with a son, David. Um, and you'll notice that they died in Comedia, Coimedia. Um, and uh, they'd gone back to farm the 1,300 acres of land that William had bought earlier uh, when he was the shoemaker. Yeah, so 12 years after he'd uh, come back to Kikubri, William Hornell and his son David both went back to Australia. Um, and you'll note they both died at Koimadia uh, in Victoria. Um, and they'd gone back there to farm the 1,300 acres of land that William had purchased earlier. Um, when the boot and shoe trade were dwindling, he thought he'd better get other, another source of income. Um, so there's a strong connection between um, Hornell and, and Australia. So now we move on to our next stone, which Don will tell us all about, the stone dedicated to uh, William Johnston. This is a beautifully decorated box grave for a local merchant, William Johnston, who died in 1845, and it commemorates 
his immediate family. He had six children, two of whom died in infancy. Uh, one died in New York. He was a merchant in 1848. Two daughters never married at all and because of the legacy he left them became uh, well healed living in Kukubri. And lastly, he had a son, James, who uh, was mentally ill and was in the Crichton Asylum in Dumfries until he died there in 1895. William Johnson was a very successful merchant. He left an extensive will and extensive accounts which indicate that he was a very, very astute businessman. He made his money not only through trading and shipping, but through investment in land and uh, bonds. And it was largely through the land ownership and the bonds that he was able to uh, leave behind considerable assets on his death. Besides looking after his family, his extensive will also indicates that he wanted to leave money to build a free school in Kukubri. And for that purpose, he left £5,000 in trust uh, to be administered to uh, staff a school and to build and maintain a school. And it became known as the Johnston School in Kukubri. The architect for the project was an interesting character. He was James Newlands, the son of an Edinburgh rope maker, uh, a very progressive man and had very different ideas on what could be done with the money that Johnson left. And he immediately criticised to the trustees the amount of money that Johnson had left because Johnston had specified exactly what he wanted the school to, be, uh, to consist of and how big it should be. And uh, James Newland said it couldn't be done with the money. So there was quite a controversy after his death before ultimately a design was agreed. And the school was built over the next three years after Johnston's death and opened in September uh, 1848 as a free school and 275 pupils from Kukubri uh, were there to begin their free education. Uh, the school finally closed in 2010 uh, when a new primary school was opened in Kukubri and it lay uh, unused for a while until it was taken over by a development trust and that development trust has refurbished the school and I'm delighted to say it has recently reopened as a, a mixed resource centre which includes things like uh, a dark skies uh, unit, uh, distillery, a pottery, uh, office services and so on. So Johnson's name lives on in the Johnson Centre. I referred to the uh, architect for the school, for, who was James Newlands. He was an interesting character. Um, shortly after he took on the commission to build, to design the school, he was offered the post of borough engineer in Liverpool, and he immediately set about designing the sewerage system in Liverpool uh, to deal with a major problem of early death amongst people because of the terrible sewage system that Liverpool had. And he became part of a trio of well-known uh, a doctor and a, a, an inspector of nuisances who successfully increased uh, life expectancy in Liverpool through uh, the design of an improved system of health, uh, sewage system and uh, health improvements. He also went on to serve in the Crimea in 1854 to 56. He was called out from the borough of Liverpool 
and actually worked with Florence Nightingale during the Crimean War, where most of the casualties amongst uh, British troops were caused not by enemy action, but by disease. We're now going to look at the headstone of William Hannah Clark. Well, here we have a gravestone in memory of William Hannah Clark. And you see he puts him down as an artist. However, he qualified as a dentist and practiced in Glasgow for nine years. But his first love was always painting. And he attended evening classes in the Glasgow School of Art. And in 1913, he decided to give up the surgery for the studio. Uh, and giving up his lucrative career, he left the bustle of the city and came down to settle in the quaint old borough of Kikubri, where he fitted seamlessly into the artist's colony. He mainly painted the local landscape and seascapes, um, and uh, they were very popular and sold very well. And with the proceeds of these paintings, he had an architect design a substantial home and studio in the town. Now, one day he was in the joiner's yard inspecting these new doors for his house when the doors fell over and he fell from a great height onto the concrete floor below and was killed almost instantly. Well, the people of the town were shocked because he'd become such a well-liked resident and his fellow artists were equally dismayed um, because he was really on the up uh, becoming a very accomplished artist whose career had suddenly become uh, ended at the tender age of 42. And now the stone was sculpted by uh, Alexander Proudfoot, who was the head of sculpture at the Glasgow School of Art, uh, a friend and fellow artist. So this is kind of a mark of respect to, to this fellow friend. But his legacy continues <coughs> through his... Uh, <coughs> Uh, his grandson Peter, Peter Wimbush, whose death is also recorded here. Now before he died, <coughs> Peter inaugurated the Young Artists Competition uh, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Kakubri, of which he was a very keen member. And he left funds to fund uh, this artist's, um, Young Artists uh, Competition. And the main prize is for the William Hannah Clark Trophy. Um, and his wife, Christine, continues that fund, mainly through the proceeds of a book that she wrote on William Hannah Clark himself. Uh, many of his paintings are on display at the Kikubri Art Gallery, uh, and again, along with his contemporaries in, in here in Kikubri, uh, again, a highly respected uh, artist. Uh, so now we're off to look at the gravestone of uh, uh, John McClure. So here we have the stone to Admiral John McClure of the Imperial Chinese Navy. So you'd think there's got to be a story behind these, this stone. Um, John McClure was born in Kikubri in 1837 and after he left school he joined the Merchant Marine out in the Far East and worked for 14 years for the well-known company Jardine and Mathewson. He served on various boats and ships and um, got to know the uh, coastline of the uh, coastal ports of Chinese China very well indeed. And then when the war broke out between China and Japan in 1894, he was appointed the captain on a dispatch ship ferrying messages between the various Chinese ports. And this brought him to the attention of the distinguished Admiral Ting, who recalled him from his dispatch boat and appointed him as an, assist an assistant admiral. He was also made a Mandarin of the highest order. Now during this conflict, the Chinese fleet was annihilated at the Battle of Yalu River, uh, and they retreated to the port of Wei Highway to make a last stand. But that battle ended in utter defeat as well. Now such was the shame of this uh, episode that all the admirals of the Chinese Navy committed suicide. So it was left to John McClure to do the negotiation of the surrender on behalf of the Chinese Navy. He was taken to Japan, um, <coughs> uh, but he was released because the Japanese were so impressed by his seamanship uh, and bravery uh, that they let him go. So he came back to Kikubri to settle back here. So although it says he, was, he died in Galveston, uh, 
he always made it clear that he wanted to be buried in his hometown of Kikubri. So I think it's only fair that we point out to people uh, this local lad who was revered by the Chinese, respected by the Japanese, and yet goes largely unknown. So now we move on to another um, sea-related uh, set of graves uh, related to the, uh, the Glenster disaster. So these headstones here are in memory of five servicemen who died in the Leinster disaster. Now the Leinster was a Royal Mail ship that uh, traded between Dunleary and Holyhead uh, where they sorted the mail um, en route. And uh, on the morning of the 10th of October it set off with uh, 77 crew, 180 passengers of whom 22 were postal workers who were sorting the mail as they crossed the Irish Sea. But the bulk of the passengers were servicemen from a variety of different nations uh, who were either going on leave or coming back from leave. Um, and I say they made up a cr the total of passengers on the ship then were 771. Now, about 12 miles out to sea, it uh, was torpedoed three times by U boat 123. Um, and within 12 minutes, it had sunk headfirst into the Irish Sea. And the official death total is 501. These are here because they were buried wherever the bodies uh, came on, on, on shore. And there were bodies buried uh, on quite a few uh, different kirkyards. So the, the rear stone was erected by the town of Kikubri on behalf of the families of these servicemen. And these five stones were erected later uh, by the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. What is particularly sad for me is that four days before this attack, the US President Woodrow Wilson had received a message from Germany uh, requesting the cessation of hostilities. And on the 21st of October, uh, all the U-boats were ordered to return to port and they were banned from any attacks on merchant vessels. Sadly, all too late for the Leinster, which went down, as you see, on the 10th of October. 1918. Right, so that takes us to the end of our tour, but you'd be welcome to join us any time on these walks. Uh, so please look at the website um, www.kakubrihistorysociety.org.uk where you'll find all the information on the dates and times of tours. Or follow us on Facebook. Uh, you can also join the History Society who are doing the town walks uh, again, which have become very popular, um, uh, again, pointing out the highlights of some of the buildings and uh, businesses and other things in, in Kikubri. Mm -hmm.